What is good, VCA Church? A few announcements, and then we're going to jump into John chapter 19. So you can start turning there right now. We have a lot of good things going on. Wednesdays, we are praying together both online and here in person. We have the chairs in groups of two spread out all over the sanctuary. We're allowed up to 25% capacity. So if you'd like to join us in person, please join us. If you're not, make sure you set aside 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., on Wednesdays to pray. That's the most important thing we can do together. Saturdays at 6.30, we have outdoor service, full worship service, preaching of God's word. And Sunday mornings at 8.30, we are worshiping outside and preaching the word. Kids ministries at both, so you can bring the kiddos. Men, we have our men's Bible study Thursday at seven o'clock in the morning. We were meeting outside when it was cold. Guys bringing their blankies. Actually, just me. Some of the guys are grown men wearing shorts. But we were meeting outside. Now we're allowed to meet inside, a little more cozy, a little more comfortable. But we got the fire inside of us anyway, so it doesn't matter. But we meet at 7 o'clock in the morning, and it's just a great in-depth Bible study. Well, let's jump into our word for today. John chapter 19. We are in part two of our new series entitled, Quotes from the Cross. We are studying each of the seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. Last week, Pastor Mark preached on, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And oh boy, I've just never heard it gone that deep before. If you missed it, go back and listen to it. He also covered, this day you will be with me in paradise. And so he covered two really powerful statements from the cross. And today, we're going to be looking at when Jesus looked at Mary from the cross. He is hanging on the cross, paying the price for our sin. He had been scourged at the order of Pontius Pilate where they ripped his back open. I mean, horrifying, horrifying, horrible, painful. The crown of thorns on his head and mockery and those thorns shoved into his brow and around his head. His face must have been covered in blood and and they beat him in the face and smacked him around. And then he had to carry that cross up to the hill where they nailed his hands. They nailed his feet. They stripped him naked and they gambled for his garments. And they lifted that cross and it sunk into the ground. And he was upright before the masses, ashamed. And all of that so that he could be the perfect sacrifice as God would pour his wrath out on Jesus for our sin to pay the price that we owed that we could never pay and God poured his wrath out on Jesus and Jesus died of the wrath of God not of crucifixion but there he was on a cross demonstrating his love for us paying the price for us and we know he would go on to raise from the dead but at this point he is there on the cross and he says woman behold your son and he said to John, his disciple, John, behold your mother. Let's read it together. Therefore the soldiers did these things, verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that is John who was writing this. John was right there at the feet of Jesus, looking up at Jesus on the cross, excruciating pain, watching his Savior, his hero, his mentor, his friend, his God, his Messiah, dying on a cross. There he was, and Jesus looked down at him, his face battered and bloody, and he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he looked to John, and he said, Behold your mother. From that hour forward, the disciple took Mary into his own household. What Jesus is saying there is, Mother, you're now going to be taken care of by John. John, look after my mother when I'm gone. I know, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And this day you will be with me in paradise. Seem like there's so much deep theology we can grasp from those statements. But what can we learn from this statement? Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. I think first of all, we learn of the great care of Jesus at the cross. The great care of Jesus, caring for the needs of his mother, 
Even while he was on the cross, at the height of his pain, at the climax of his mission, he thought of his mother's well-being. To think of someone else when you are in sheer agony shows that you have tremendous care. And Jesus was God in flesh. We can know that God has tremendous care for us based on this quote from Jesus. Mother, behold your son. I remember when I was training for the sheriff's department, part of the training was getting gassed, like the gas they use in riots and things like that. And we had to stand in formation and they threw CN gas canister at our feet and then the gas, it was sizzling, it was spinning and you see the gas is coming out, this white gas came out and CN gas agitates your eyes and your nose and your mucous membranes and it's not pleasant at all and survived that one no problem. I mean, it was not fun. But after the CN gas, they bring out the CS gas. They say CN stands for cry now. CS stands for cry sooner. It's terrible. This one doesn't just get your mucous membranes and your eyes and your nose and your throat, but it actually gets at your lungs and it makes you feel like your lungs are shrinking down and it gets in your throat and makes you feel like your throat is burning and closing. And they told us ahead of time, you're going to feel like you're going to die, but you're not going to die. You're going to feel like you're suffocating and you can't breathe but you can breathe ever so slightly, so don't panic. And so the guy next to me nudges me, he says, hey, let's interlock arms, we're not gonna leave each other. And the person on the other side of me saw him, and he goes, yeah, I'll lock arms, we're not gonna leave each other, no matter what, no matter what we're gonna stand in, we're gonna stay together, we're gonna hold together. And they threw that canister in there, and it was spinning, and it was sizzling, and the white smoke was coming out, and it's sure enough, tiniest little breath, you can't hold your breath that long, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a mistake to try, but the slightest little breath, and I could feel the lungs, I could feel the throat closing, and I felt like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe, I, I can't breathe. And I could get that little, uh, little breath ever so slight. It was about six seconds that those guys on my right and on my left who swore they would never leave me, that we would be in this together. After maybe five or six seconds, they were a cloud of dust and a dot running to get out because of what they were suffering, because of what they were going through. The needs of others just went out the window and it was all about self-preservation. Get me out of here. This is painful. I could die. I can't breathe. I have to get out. I don't care about interlocking arms anymore. I'm out of here. That's the normal human response but Jesus at the height of his pain the suffering as the weight of all of our sin was crushing him on the cross he knows his mother's going to need someone to look after her the heart of Jesus to care was on display at the cross and I want to talk about three types of needs to get started here spiritual needs we know that that Jesus cares for our spiritual needs. That's the whole point of the cross. That's our salvation of our soul, that Jesus took the wrath of God on our behalf so that we could be in right standing with God. We could be reconnected and redeemed by God to, to save our soul, our spiritual need. Jesus took up the cross. He said in John chapter 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He cares about our spiritual needs, that we're not spiritually hungry and thirsty and starving and withering and dying, but that our spirit within us is alive and thriving. I love Psalm 23, often overlooked when it says, He restores my soul. We have doctors for broken arms and, you know, sinus infections, but who can restore a broken soul? Jesus, because He cares about your spiritual needs. He also cares about your emotional needs. We see this in that quote on the cross. Luke chapter 2, verse 35. Actually, when Jesus was born, it was prophesied to Mary that your, a sword will pierce your own soul. Meaning, when you see Jesus, your son, on the cross, beaten and bloody and broken and mocked and being crushed, when you see that, it's just going to cut your soul open like a sword is going to pierce you. This is going to be heart-wrenching. You are going to be emotionally shattered and broken. And Mary's heart was pierced, emotionally devastated. Jesus cared about the needs of her emotions. And Jesus cares about you as well. Psalm chapter 147 verse 3, He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up 
their wounds. He cares about your emotional needs. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. So do not let your heart be troubled. He wants you to have that inner peace. That emotional peace. That wholeness. I remember when my daughter was born and they had to give her a shot and she was just a newborn and they give her that shot and when they put that needle in her arm, her eyes immediately locked onto mine and they were wide and they were terrified and she looked at me almost like, Daddy, why are you letting them do this? And when she had that fear running through her heart and her body, even at just a day old, when she was just filled with fear, my heart broke because I cared desperately about the emotional needs of my children. And I know you as parents, you feel that same way. God as your heavenly father cares deeply about your emotional well-being. And that is clearly on display. When he looks at his mother, he says, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He is caring for her emotionally as he knows she is just devastated in this moment. You know, I heard a story, it's about that movement called Love 146, an organization that rescues kids who are in the sex slavery. They're being trafficked, living horrifying, ter terrible, tragic lives. And there was one, when one of the owners was visiting one of these safe houses, and I've shared this before, I believe, but um, it's amazing sometimes when I think I've shared something and I share it, how the look of shock, like none of you have heard this before, uh, so I'll share it again because it's such a powerful story. But one of the owners went to one of the safe houses and he was having lunch and hanging out with the kids and talking to the, the directors and the people who were in charge of that particular facility. And there was one little girl in the corner who was the whole time just scooping up dirt with her hand in the dirt yard. Um, it was in a different country and, and she was putting dirt on her head and rubbing dirt on her face. And it was almost as if to say, I just want to melt into the ground just shattered and devastated emotionally, a million pieces, and just bankrupt emotionally from what she had been through. But they taught them the love of Jesus. They taught them the love of God. They taught them the word of God. They gave them value. And day after day, week after week, month by month, year after year, they were just loving these girls and teaching them the goodness of God. That director came back to that same uh, safe house about a year later. And he was doing his same route and checking in with the leaders and having meetings and having lunch and goofing around with the kids. And one of the kids came up to him and took him by the hand and made this kind of gangly, goofy, non-rhythmic uh, white guy get up and dance. And he's dancing and this little girl's dancing with him and they're laughing and they're joking and they're smiling and they're laughing at him and just having a grand old time. And in the meeting afterwards, he says, last time I was here, there was a girl who was just broken and uh, I, I just, I've never gotten over her. I've been praying for her. She was putting dirt on her head. I don't know if you remember. She was right over there. And, um, and the director said, oh, you didn't, you didn't recognize her. He said, no. Did I see her? And he said, yeah. That's the girl that came over and picked you up and danced with you and was laughing with you and was joking with you. That's the same girl. The transformation because of the message and the love of Jesus. She was emotionally devastated and bankrupt and broken. And God turned her mourning into dancing, as the scripture said. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17, I will restore you to health. I will heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. In other words, you feel like no one cares about you in the world. And as in their case, no one did care about them. But you feel like you're unseen, you're unheard, nobody's watching you, but I will restore you, I love you, I will heal you, I will bind your wounds. It reminded me of Hagar from the book of Genesis, how she was a slave and she was used and she was pregnant and she was mistreated and she went on the run and, and the, the angel of the Lord appears to her and says, where have you come from and where are you going? And she says, well, I've just been abused and I'm, I'm on the run. I don't really know where I'm going was kind of the attitude there. Those questions, where have you come from? Where are you going? I'm coming from, I'm coming from brokenness. I'm coming from, from abuse. I'm coming from tragedy and I'm going nowhere. But the Lord saw her and the Lord met with her in the desert. And after that encounter, she was encouraged. She was emotionally healed at that point in her life. And she was going back to where she was supposed to be. And she said, you are the God who sees me. That's what she called God. She didn't know what to call him. And she says, you are the God who sees me. Of all the gods that there were in that culture, and she was Egyptian, of all her gods, none of them had that attribute. But she met the real living God and she called him, you're the God who sees me.
You are important to God. Jesus shows that he cares for your spiritual needs as well as your emotional needs in this statement on the cross. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And beyond the spiritual needs and the emotional needs, we know Jesus cares about the physical needs as well. Mary would need someone to provide for her. Joseph had passed away some time earlier. And in that culture, a widowed woman did not have much opportunity. Jesus cared about her physical well-being as well. She's going to need someone to care for her, to make sure she has proper food, to make sure she has proper clothing, that she's in a loving environment, spiritual needs, emotional needs, physical needs. We see all of that in this quote from Jesus on the cross. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, we quote it often. So don't worry about these things. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things, physical things, will be added unto you. Jesus cares about your spiritual needs, your emotional needs, as well as your physical needs. The prophet Joel prophesied the word of God saying he will give back and restore the years the locusts have stolen. They had horrible locust invasions that ate all of their crops that bankrupted them in the moment but also bankrupted their future as well. They had lost years to these locust invasions and somehow, some way, God would miraculously give them those years that the locusts had stolen. He cared about their physical needs, their ability to farm, their ability to have an income, their ability to have businesses, their ability to survive. Physically, he cared. Time and space, the time it took to grow those crops, the space that they needed in this space and all that takes place in this physical realm, it matters to God. Your physical needs matter to God. Your physical well-being, your healing, the things you're dealing with in your sicknesses, they matter to Jesus. And we see this all in this quote on the cross. Side note about physical needs. And I think this is true probably of spiritual and emotional needs as well. But side note, yet it's a very powerful note. And I've learned it a little bit by experience, but also here in the Word of God. God seems to bless us when we bless others. When we give, especially out of our own lack, there seems to be a tremendous blessing that follows. When you're weak, when you're worn out, when you're broken, and you reach out and you help someone else who's weak, and worn out and broken. Everything in you says, I just want to stay on the couch. I just want to sleep. I don't want to help. I'm too hurt. I'm too sad. I'm too broken. I, I, I'm too taint, tainted and tarnished by this life. There's, it's just been too, I, I, I'm so weak and broken as an individual. I, I can't reach. But if you will overcome that and get out and help and bless someone, you're going to see the floodgates of blessing open in your life. Financially, the same thing. When they saw that widow putting in those two mites in the offering, those two pennies basically in the offering, it was said they gave more than all of these others because she gave out of lack. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. So I'm going to read a, a healthy portion of Scripture here. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. In other words, God's going to keep supplying you so that you can keep abounding in good works to others, as it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies the seed to the sower, the bread for the food, will supply and multiply your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Did you catch that? Wow. You will be enriched in every way to be a blessing in every way. He will give seed to the sower, bread to the, the, the guys who are baking the bread so that they can go out and multiply it and give it. How about Job? Can't get through a sermon without at least mentioning Job, all his struggles, all his loss. 42.10, Job, when Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had had before. I don't think it's a magic formula. I think there's something there. When we overcome our own insufficiencies and our own brokenness and we go meet someone else at their point of need, whether it's in our health, our physical body, whether it's in our finances, whether it's in something spiritual and prayer filled, whatever it is, whatever we have that we give, God is going to give us more so we can abound more. He cares about our 
physical needs as well. And there's really one key we see in our text. I know there's probably a few other keys, but in our text, one key to consistency, consistently receiving this type of care. But I'm not going to give that to you yet. I'm going to give it to you in a few minutes, so you have to keep on listening. So we see the care of Jesus in this quote from the cross. We also see, point two, the connection of Jesus at the cross. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Those at the cross are called to be connected to one another. Still true for you and I today. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Mary would need someone to provide for her and look after her. John would benefit from having the influence of a godly woman like Mary in his household. There at the cross, John and Mary became connected in a whole new way. Not only do we need to connect to Jesus at the cross by faith, that time we come to that faith in Jesus, you, you're my Savior, Lord, forgive me of my sin. You paid the price on the cross. I believe, Lord, I want to walk with you. We get connected with Jesus. We start walking our lives by faith, but we can also connect with each other. Look around. If you're watching online, think, who can I care for? Who can I connect with? Who can I reach out to to have a rich relationship with? Maybe you need a mentor. You can find that at the foot of the cross. Maybe you're someone who has a lot of wisdom that you can give to someone. You can find that at the foot of the cross. Maybe you need a, a father figure or a mother figure. Maybe you need a sister or a brother. You can find that at the cross. Look around. Say, Lord, who can I connect with? Romans 12, verse 5. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. We all come together and we connect. We are connected to each other at the cross by faith. So I want to encourage you to encourage one another. Fulfill those important roles in one another's lives. Because we're living in a fallen and broken world. John should have never had to be Mary's son. Mary should have never needed a son. She should have had a husband still and, and sons of her own. She should have had Jesus still in her life. But we're in a fallen and in a broken world, and at the cross, we connect to Jesus and we say, hallelujah, my soul is saved. This burden is gone and I'm filled with this supernatural joy and peace and inner strength and a connection and a relationship with Jesus. And then we start finding out we have these special connections with each other that are eternal, lifelong, and beyond connections that can help empower us and enrich us and fulfill us in our points of need in this life. There's one key I see. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Ecclesiastes 4.1, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A threefold cord is not easily broken. The cross brings us all together. All different races, all different backgrounds, all different cultures, because we all have a degree of brokenness and loss because of the state of this world. And we can find the things that we are lacking as we connect to Jesus and we connect to one another at the cross. Are you at the foot of the cross? Or are you running? Or are you hiding? Or are you just plain too busy? We had some in there, not, not at the cross because they were too busy. They heard Jesus on the hillsides, but yeah, it turns out he got arrested. He's getting crucified. Uh, they're not going to go. A lot of the disciples, all the other disciples were in running and hiding for fear. John was at the cross. Mary was at the cross. Another person was at the cross. And two more Marys were at the cross by my count. Something like that. Check it out. But those at the cross, and check this out, those at the cross who were not family became family. Think about that. It's a beautiful thing. Those who were at the foot of the cross as Jesus was hanging there, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. They were not family, but they became family. Mary had already lost a husband and now she's losing her son and in a brutal and treacherous manner. John was losing his friend, his mentor, his hero, his Messiah. John was so close with Jesus, but they were connected to each other in a new, meaningful, powerful, life-changing way by Jesus at the cross. He connected them. They were not family, but they became family. And maybe you have some needs because of the brokenness in this world. Maybe you need a mother figure, a father figure. Maybe you need a brother. Maybe you need a sister. Maybe you need a spouse. Let Jesus connect you at the cross in the body of Christ. As we remain close to Jesus, we come close to him because we love him. We want to know him. We want to pursue him. We want to walk with him. And as we do that, he takes those who are not family and makes them family. 
I can't think of a better example than an old neighbor of mine. And they took in, uh, they were a Hispanic family, they, they took in a, a young African-American baby, foster care, just, they were only supposed to have this little baby, Sean, he was a newborn, for about a month, I believe. And a month came and went, and they said, we well, don't have anywhere else to put him, would you keep him another month? They said, absolutely. Two months turned into two years of just prolonging when they would remove him or, or take him to another home. And in two years, Sean had become like their son. I don't remember exactly how long or exactly how old he was, but he had not called his father dad yet. He had not said dad or papa. He didn't say much at all. And then the call came. We have an opportunity to relocate Sean. We understand he's been with you for a few years now. We'd like to ask you to consider adopting him. Full, full adoption. We'll need an answer in a couple of weeks. Wow, that's heavy. Wow, they did not anticipate that or sign up for that, but here they were. And it, years had gone by. So they start, talked as a family, had a couple family meetings, and father decided, as he prayed, just felt it on his heart. Here's how you'll know if you're to adopt him full time. If he calls you dad before the date comes. First week went by, he hadn't said dad. Tuck him in, kiss him goodnight. Hadn't said it. Just say goodnight. Came down to the last couple nights. Second to last night, hadn't said it. Praying, God, am I to adopt this little boy? If he calls you dad. If he calls you dad. Little Sean didn't know, but the next day was going to be the day. And dad walked in the room at night, kissed him on the forehead, prayed with him. As he was walking, he said, goodnight, Sean. Turned out the lights. Stood for a half a moment, heard this little voice from the bed say, Good night, Dad. He turned the lights back on, ran back in the room, picked that little boy up. My son! You're my son! He knew. He knew it was of God to adopt this little boy, which he, he desperately wanted to do in his heart all along. He was trying to do the right thing by his family and everything. And, and he picked up that Sean and, You are my son. God makes family where there was not family before. And if you're struggling with that emptiness, with those emotional needs, with that need to connect because we're in a fallen world, Jesus can be your everything. But even Adam in the garden, Jesus looked at him and said, it's not good that man should be alone. He needs someone to connect with, someone who's not family to become family. You can find that at the foot of the cross as you walk with Jesus. But as I've been saying, there's sort of one key to the whole thing. You ready to hear the key? You're going to be underwhelmed because it's super simple. Here it is. And I made it begin with a C. You ready? Carry on at the cross. You must be one of the ones who carries on at the cross. The other disciples had run. They were in hiding. They were afraid. Many of the other followers and the masses of Jesus were just going on with their life because I guess it's over now. Some were sad. Some were upset. But only a few were carrying on with Jesus as he was on the cross saying through it all, we're going to stand by you. And as you do that, you'll receive that type of care that we talked about, the, the, the spiritual need, the emotional needs, the physical needs. If we carry on close to Jesus, you'll receive that connection that we have, a connection to God and, and special connections to one another, even to the point where we were not family, but we become family. But we must carry on at the cross. We must show up. We must be there. We must hang on through hard times. If you desire an intimate an incredible care from Jesus and of Jesus, you must carry on in faith at the cross. If you desire those life-changing, enriching, healing, sustaining connections with others, you must carry on in faith at the cross. What does carry on mean? The Webster's Dictionary defines carry on as this. A bag or suitcase taken onto an aircraft as handheld luggage. Why is that significant? Because we must handheld Jesus as we go on to the aircraft of life. <laughs> I'm joking. That, that is the definition, but that's just a funny definition. That's the, the wrong definition. <laughs> a suitcase, carry on the aircraft of life. No, here's carry on. Here's the, here's the definition that fits what I'm talking about. To continue an activity or a task. 
to continue to move in the same direction. In other words, come what may, we are continuing close to Jesus. Whether he's handing out bread on a sunny day or whether he's hanging on the cross, we are going to carry on with Jesus. And as we do so, we're going to receive that care that we're in his words. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. We're going to find those connections to him and to those on our left and on our right. When life is hard, when life is confusing, when life is scary, when life is heartbreaking, it was at the cross that we must continue in that same faith and devotion to Jesus as we had when the times were good, when he was breaking the bread, when miracles were popping off, when the crowds were calling for him, when he was giving out the food and they were basking in the sun and seeing all the good things and hearing the teaching and all that was going on and they were even wanting to make him king. We carried on with Jesus in the good times. But will we carry on with Jesus in those hard times, the cross times? Many did not carry on in faith at the cross. Ran, hid, moved on, went back to regular life, whatever. Others just sort of enjoyed the ridiculous show. But Mary and John and a few others, they carried on with him at the cross. A few brief points. We must carry on through fear. What will it cost me to stay at the cross? They're killing him, am I next? Most of his disciples had run and hid just in fear. Will I lose my job because of my faith? Will I lose this romance if I don't compromise because I need to stand on my faith? Will I lose these friendships? Will they think differently of me? In many countries, will I lose my freedom? Will I lose my life? Will we carry on with Jesus even through fear? At the cross, God cares. At the cross, Jesus connects us. But we must carry on, and specifically based on our text, through fear. Are you in a season of fear and anxiety? Remain at the cross. Don't give up. Don't turn away. Carry on. Carry on through confusion. They must have been confused, Mary and the disciples, to see the Messiah. I know he had told them, but I don't think it had sunk in. To see the Messiah, the Son of God, the miracle worker, the one who raised people from the dead for crying out loud. He had fed tens of thousands of people to see him tortured, nailed, blood-covered, mocked, naked, gasping, and then dead. How could this be? How could this happen? God, where are you? We, we, we thought, we, we believed. And then the worst, most horrific, shameful, gruesome ending, confusion, darkness, loss, pain. How can this be? Carry on at the cross. Job, how can this be? And at the end of Job, because he carried on in faith, Job was able to say, before my trial, I had heard of you, God, with the hearing of my ear. But after all I've been through, now I see you with my eyes. Wow. Carry on at the cross. Carry on through confusion. I love the young man who, who pilgrimed to find Mother Teresa in India. And he finally got to her. And she said, what can I do? How can I pray for you? And he said, Mother Teresa, I just have a lot of thoughts in my mind. And I want you to pray for me for clarity. She said to him, no. I will not pray for clarity. I will only pray for trust. Wow. To carry on with Jesus, even when you can't see what, why, who, where, how could this happen? I'm confused to carry on. Are you in a season of confusion where you just don't get what's going on? Remain at the cross. Don't give up. Don't turn away. Carry on. And lastly, in our text, we see a whole lot of heartbreak. Carry on through heartbreak. Mary was pierced, the scripture said. Her heart was just pierced. But she remained at the cross. I also thought of Peter who was a broken man, heartbroken by the crucifixion, by his own failure to love Jesus as he had promised to love Jesus. I'll never deny you. I'll die with you. And then he denied Jesus. And the rooster crowed. But after the resurrection, Jesus connected specifically with Peter and restored him. Restored him to strength and ministry. 
But he was so heartbroken. Peter wept bitterly. John, here at the foot of the cross, watching every gruesome moment of his Messiah being tortured, being flogged, being beaten, the thorns in his head, the nails in his hands and feet being lifted up in front of everyone, bleeding and naked. He must have been heartbroken. But Mary and John carried on at the cross. They stayed. They kept their love. They kept their faith. Wow. I interviewed uh, our youth pastor, Colin, and his mother, uh, Laura, and his wife, Malika, and their baby, Amani, made quite an appearance on the podcast as well. And uh, I interviewed them because when he was 15 years old, rewind it a little further, a couple years earlier, he was struggling in his grades, just headed for trouble, rebellion, kind of quiet, hard-hearted, and his mother could see it. And they'd had a hard life, a hard family life, hard background. And he wandered on to this church property. He came to a Sunday morning kids ministry thing, a junior high thing. Gave his life to Jesus, long story short. Jesus changed his life, revolutionized his life to the point where he was telling his adult mother at age 13 and 14 about God and about Jesus and how God loved her and all this, the, the gospel message. And, and she started coming as well. And right when she started coming, they found out Colin had a tumor the size of a fist in his, in his skull. And that he was given, they rushed him to Loma Linda. And I know you've heard the story, but you may not have heard this aspect of the story. It's on the We Carry the Fire podcast. Look it up, called Brain Tumor Miracle. Listen to it, send it to a friend. Hear little baby Imani squawking in the background, pretty awesome. But Laura, his mother, was told, Colin has a 50-50 chance of not waking up from this surgery. 50-50. This may be the last conversation that you have with your son, 15 years old. And if he does come back, he, he might not have all of his mental faculties. He might not be able to walk. We, we don't know what the result's going to be. And in that conversation that she had with him, before they put him under, she told him, I want you to know, Colin, even if you don't make it, I will not blame God. We're going to keep walking by faith. That was a huge deal to Colin. He had brought her to faith in Jesus. He had brought his mother to the faith in Jesus. He had brought her to the cross. She said, we're going to keep going. Wow, that even if you don't, I'm not going to blame God. Even through heartbreak, we just trust God. Jesus cared for their needs. He connected them. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. For the rest of their lives, they would have an incredible mother-son bond because they carried on together at the cross. They were there together. And at the cross, God cares spiritually, emotionally, physically, and God connects. And those who are not family can become family. And in this fallen and broken world, God can bring someone to stand in the place for someone who's missing in your life. God cares. God connects. But our part, we must carry on at the cross. Don't give up. Don't turn back. Don't run away. Carry on. Mother, behold, your son shows us the care of Jesus. Shows us how Jesus connects us to himself and to one another. But we must carry on through fear, through confusion, and even through heartbreak. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you made this statement on the cross. At first glance, a somewhat peculiar statement to be in the Holy Scripture. But Lord, as we just witnessed and studied together, it teaches us an incredible truth about your heart and even your actions. Lord, help us to carry on at the cross. Lord, help us through seasons and times of fear, confusion, and heartbreak to stay ever so close to you. And Lord, may we receive from you that care that you have for us. Spiritually, may we be strong and full, Lord. Emotionally, may we be put together and well and filled with peace, Lord. Physically, the things that we need to live and thrive and even bless others. Lord, we look to you for that type of care. And Father, make those ever important connections in our lives. First and foremost, may our connection to you be strong. May we hear your voice clearly. As we read your word, may it jump off the page and into our hearts. And Lord, connect us to one another. Where we were not family before, may we be family moving forward. We thank you and love you 
that you care for us and that you are our great connector. Lord, help us to carry on. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.